the movie back. All right. They're just up here. This is the main one. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right. I see he's getting a little rebound back there. So. Morning, friends. Can you hear me all right back there? Thank you. I'm certainly a, a privileged person this morning to come here to this platform after such noble testimonies has been given to try to, to place just a little more with what they have said uh, to bring blessings to us as we've enjoyed this morning. Now, I noticed some of them are very... Right, sir. Is that better? Well, with, um, some of the men hear how they have spoken. Most uh, everyone, well, everyone up here had a real bright, brilliant testimony. How I appreciate that, that fine testimony for the Lord. Now, we're going to approach the Word. And I, this week I have purposed in my heart not to keep people these two and three hours sitting listening to me. I'll tell you why I, I do that, friends. I'm uneducated, and I only can speak by inspiration. Now, a man that's got an education when he's inspired too, but he can explain what he's talking about by his education, draw out words that will uh, let the people know what he's talking about. Without an education, I have to take symbols of nature and express through the inspiration that I have. And that makes it pretty hard sometimes for the people to really to understand. We find that I was very disturbed about it until I found in the Bible that God did the same manner, same ways. We notice like John, the Baptist, when uh, we don't have any record of his education. And then when he, when he come out of the wilderness, he began to speak to the, the, his congregation, the church of that day. And we notice how he expressed it. He said, you generation of snakes. See, that's what he's used to, nature in the wilderness. In other words, something that's slippery and slimy and deceiving. Now, some other man might have been able to have brought down some word that would have said imposters or some word he could use to express that. But John used the word snake. I think everybody understood what he talked about. So then he said, don't begin to think, to say within yourselves that we belong to this and we belong to that. Because I tell you, God's able to these rocks here. See? They not some other great some. God's able these stones. He expressed it in nature. And also the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Some good educated brother with that same inspiration might have said he will uh, annihilate. He said the axe is at the root of the tree. That annihilates it anyhow. <laughs> so he, he knew that it was, he had those expressions. For, perhaps he never had any schooling. Let us bow our heads just a moment. I have a request here for prayer which that is my ministry, praying for the sick. And I've got some requests in here, some very outstanding requests. And I know there's many in here, and if there's some this morning that would like to be remembered, well, if you just raise up your hands to God, say, I, now, just hold your request while we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are now approaching Thy holiness through the name of Thy holy child, the Lord Jesus, to ask this petition of each of the people that's wrote out their requests that I have it here in my hand, especially this brother's young, beautiful daughter that's been torn up in that accident. I pray for that child, Lord. And I pray for all the other requests and the ones that's secretly to us now, only to the one that raised her hand. But thou art the infinite God. You know every motive and all of our requests. We pray that you'll answer because you promised it. We believe it. And we ask now that you'll take these few words that we shall read and inspire them to us, Lord, as we wait upon thee. May the Holy Spirit draw nigh unto each one and reveal to us the interpretation of the word. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, sir, brother. Just help yourself. That's all right while I'm turning. Now, I have a... Used to be I could remember my scriptures and things without having a, a note. But since I've passed 25, that don't work so good. I uh, have to remember by writing it out. 
Now we're going, is that better? Can you hear that better? Uh, no, in the back they're shaking their heads. Maybe um, have to stand. Right, how would this be like this? Can you hear that? How about that? Is that better? Fine, that's good. Now I wish to call your attention to, to Isaiah 42, 1 to 7. And also to Matthew four fifteen to sixteen, behold my servant, who I uphold mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. The bruised reed shall he not break. The smoke and flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment unto the earth, and the isle shall wait for his law. Thus saith the Lord, He that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth, and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth bread unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walk therein, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine hand, will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prisons, and then set in darkness out of prison houses. And now... In St. Matthew 4, beginning with the 12th verse, we read this. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee, leaving Nazareth, he come and dwelt in Capernaum, which is up on the sea coast of the borders of Zebulun and Nephilim, that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun, and the land of Nephilim, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them that sat in the regions of the shadows of death, light is sprung up. From that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The Lord bless his word. Now. My subject this morning is turn on the light and just as quick as I can so you can be out for this uh, next appointment now which will be in about 45 minutes. Uh, you know, Mr. McAnilly, I think he's present. I've seen his truck outside. Some time ago we were setting one of my first trips here to Arizona to go hunting. We were sitting out here near the superstitious mountain. I'd heard of it for a long time and heard many of the legends that had been told about the superstition. I remember looking for it the first time. It was before day and a great ghostly shadow hung at the east of me, which was known as the superstition. I'd heard about the Indians, how they wouldn't go near it, how they were afraid, how the Spanish had mistreated them in the early days when they was hunting gold. They claimed that evil spirits lived in it. All this stirred my curiosity. But I only had a flashlight to see the superstition first. And then I watched until after a while the majesty of the sun began to move up on the darkness. And when it did, it separated the darkness from the light and pressed the darkness back. Finally, she raised her highness up over the top of the mountain, and it showed superstition just what it was. It lit up and showed what it was. And all the spooks and fears that I had of the superstition when the sun was shining in its power upon it all fled away. The sun is the king of all lights on this earth and the natural lights. No matter how much artificial light that we can have and how many great electric rays we can produce, when that sun rises, all the rest of them dim out. That's the same thing it is with the Word of God. 
When the Word of God rises, all superstitions, denominational fanaticisms and things spread away, and it shows it just exactly what it is. God in the beginning said, let there be light. The light only comes, the true light, the king light comes by the Word of God. God separated the light from the darkness in the beginning. And the Word of God made manifest always separates the light from the darkness. People can rise up with this, that, or the other. Isms can rise. Communism, fascism, and all other isms can rise. Superstitions, cults, whatever it might be, might rise. But when that king light of the Bible raises up all superstitions and things. But you see, we know it's there. But until it's vindicated, proves it's light then we have no right to argue against that because it shuts all other light out. Jesus said, Let every man's word be a lie and mine be the truth. His word is superior over all man's words, over all anything. His word is light. And we know that in the beginning it must have been foggy and dismal and dark as the world was turning and when God knew that he had a need of light. Now, his seed was already in the earth because he had planted it there. Now, he needed light to bring forth that seed, to make that seed live because the seed was already there. Just like it is in each age. God has foretold us what would take place in each age. The only thing he needs is a manifestation of the light of God upon that scripture to make it live for that age. Just as God. And it will do it as long as the light can get to the Word. If the Word's germatized, it'll make it live if it's a promise for that day. You might plant wheat at one time or grain at another time. Some come slower than other because it depends on the season. God's Word comes in season. The law and the grace and so forth as we went on down through the ages. And each time it's lit up by the manifestation of the light spreading forth the, the life that's in the seed. By the Word of God... The sun shines today because the very sun that we're enjoying is God's Word made manifest. This very sunlight that we see outside is nothing but God's Word when He said, Let there be light. And what if He said, Let there be light, and there was no light? Then it wasn't God spoke. When God says, Let there be, there will be. And so we find out that the sun that we now are enjoying is the manifestation of God's word spoken in Genesis. And we realize that God's light of the day is His Son. The one was S-U-N, this one's S-O-N. S-O-N is the Bible. He was in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Hebrews 13, 8, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's the Word of God always. It was Christ in Noah. It was Christ in Moses. It was Christ in David that looked up as a rejected king upon the city where 800 years later Christ sat there weeping over a city being a rejected king just like David was. It's always the Spirit of Christ and the full manifestation of God's Word was made known through Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God. No life can come outside of life. Life produces, uh, light produces life. There can be no li life outside of life, natural or spiritual. There must be and only light can come by the Word of God. God's Word is the light when it's manifest. It's just a seed laying here as God planted all the seeds. Our bodies was on the earth before the world. Well, be before there's any light here, any life here, or anything, the calcium, potash, petroleum, cosmic light, whatever it was here, was here when God created the earth. It only taken His spoken word to bring it into existence, just like it did botany life or tree life or whatever life there is to be. Nothing can live natural or spiritual without His light. And His word is light and life. But... When he sends his light and makes it known to the people, and then it is rejected, then what about that? That's what we want to talk about this morning, is rejecting this light. By them it's sent to, rejects it just like it was then. Behold my servant, whom I have delighted in. He's a light to the Gentiles. He's a light to the world. He was a light of the world. 
But he was rejected. That's the sad part. And it meets that condition every time that God manifests his light. The world itself rejects that light. Why? It's written right in the Bible. Each age, God has lauded so much of his word for each age. And he always sends somebody to manifest that word. Jesus had been prophesied for 4,000 years that he would come Messiah. And when he come, he manifested every promise of Messiah. But yet the people of the world, the churches and so forth, know nothing about him. The so-called they had done, got in some other thing that kept them away from knowing this. Now what if a, a man, just to we'll take the natural part, what if a man that is born here to walk in the light of that sun, what God's created for him, and the first thing you know, he shuts his eyes, runs into the basement, closes the door, pulls down the shade, and just refuses to recognize the sun's a shining. He denies its privileges. He denies its warming rays, its life-giving resource. He denies the light that is spread so he can see where he's going, where he come from. He denies that. What would you say to a man that pulled down the shades or run into the basement and closed all the light off everywhere and just simply refused to recognize the sun was shining. There's something mentally wrong with that person. Anyone knows that a natural mind will tell you there's something wrong with that person. That he is, he's, he's, something has happened to him. He's lost his reasons. Well, so is it in the hours that we live when a man will cover himself up with some kind of a, of a excuse to actually recognize the gospel light as it's shining forth as it is today. Amen. When a man deliberately turns away from it, goes into something and pulls down the curtain and says, I don't believe it. There's something wrong with that person. Amen. There's just no way of getting around it. There's something wrong. Something has happened to him. And we find out that there's so, so much of that today. Now, Jesus was all the inspired prophets testimonies and all their prophecy was brought to light in his age that had been prophesied for his age. He lit up every candle of word that was in the Bible that was prophesied of him. A virgin shall conceive. She did. All right. His name shall be called Counselor, Prince of Peace, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. He was. And the eyes of the blind shall see. They did. Everything that was prophesied of him happened when he come on earth. And why the people could not see that? That was, it seems strange to us now because we're looking back through a rear view mirror. But did you ever know if you keep looking back that way, you're wrecked. Let's look what's ahead for us. That's what they were doing. The reason that they did that because they were living in a glare of another light. They were living in the glare of a light of another day. And that's what I believe is the matter with the world today, uh, friends, is because we're trying to live in a glare of a light that shined in another day. A glare is a false light. It's like a mirage on the road. We go down the road and see a mirage. It's a false conception of the sun. And when you get there, it hasn't produced a thing but something false. Because you cannot walk in the glare of the sun because it's a mirage always showing you something there's nothing to. And when people try to tell you that Jesus Christ isn't the same yesterday, today, and forever, they're leading you into a mirage. That's all. And when you get into church and join church, some cold creed or something like that, there's nothing there no more than what you had in the world. Let me tell you, don't refuse the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which brings the warming rays of the Holy Ghost upon you. Makes you a new creature in Christ Jesus. Don't try to walk in some glare of another age. Now, that glare might have been all right in the other age. It might have been all right for them. It proves so in the day of our Lord Jesus. He was the scriptural light of that day. He was the light. He wasn't the light until he come on the earth to vindicate the promised word. You know, he said there, John was a bright and shining light. And you love to walk in his light for a season. Certainly, because John had been prophesied by Isaiah 712 years before his birth, and a voice of one to be crying in the wilderness. And then also Malachi, the last of the prophets, 400 years before his coming in the third chapter of Math, uh, Malachi, he said, Behold, I send my messenger before my face to prepare the way. Here was John on earth 
making that written word live. He was the voice of one crying in the wilderness, and he always also was preparing the way before the Messiah. And Jesus said, you love to walk in his light because he was that light, bright and shining light. And John, he said, now I must decrease. My light must go out because why? I have served my time that's prophesied of me. Hear ye him. He's the one. Follow him. It living in that day, it proved us. Now the Jews thought that they were worshiping in the true light. They thought they were worshiping this same God that they were turning down. The very one that they thought that they were worshiping, they were crucified. They were making fun of the very God and making him a laughing stock of the people. The very God that they thought they were worshiping. May I say this with reverence and respect, but to bring light because, as a brother said a while ago, we're living later than you think we are. One of these days, something's going to happen. It's going to be too late. The people have taken on the mark of the beast, not even knowing what they're doing. Blind lead the blind, they all fall in the ditch, Jesus said. And we're living later than we think. Many honest people follow that, not even knowing what they're doing. But the hour is at hand now when the light is shining, the gospel light and its power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ manifesting itself that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He lauded that for this day. The things that he promised of this day must happen in this day. If the church won't accept that God's able these stones to rise children of Abraham. He'll get his message over because he's always done it. He always will do it. People thinking that they're walking in the light, the traditions of the fathers, and the first thing you know, they're walking in a glare of a light, not the same light. Rejected the very light that they claim to be worshiping. His works thoroughly vindicated who he was. Jesus said himself, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify me. Who can condemn me of sin, he said. Who can prove that I have said anything or any claim that I've made that the Heavenly Father hasn't vindicated that through me, has proved to you that he was a light of the hour, because it's all prophesied that this Messiah should be this way, and yet bloomed to life, but their traditions had separated them from the real light of the Word. Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians, and whatever it might be, that got the world so gommed up like they did in all ages, that they could not see the real light. It put their eyes out. They used to walk in the glare. Next day it'll be this, and tomorrow it'll be this. We'll join this, it'll be that. We'll join that. We find it's a false mirage. Jesus Christ is just as real today to a human heart as He ever was. His power and His living presence is just as real today as it ever was. Oh, a little while, and the world won't see me no more. Cosmos, the order of the world won't see me anymore. Yet ye shall see me, for I'll be with you, even in you, to the end of the world. The works that I do shall you do also. Even greater than this shall you do, because I go to my Father. That great promise is today. The world is as blind as they can be. But there is a ye that shall see me. And that's what we're trying to get today. What the full gospel mean is to express Jesus Christ in the power of his resurrection. And all the fullness of his promises. That the Holy Ghost manifest these things and make them right. That God has promised and he will do it. Yes, sir. He had been thoroughly vindicated by the, the word and by the works that he was doing, but none of them wanted to believe it. Proved his light was the word. The word said it. Search the scriptures. But their traditions that they were living in, a glare of another age. They said, we believe Moses. Moses, who we believe. We don't know which you come from. Where'd you get your education? What, what can you prove that you're this? His works testified who he was. If they'd only read the Bible, they was reading it, but they couldn't see it. My works identify me. A man's note by his credentials, the credentials of the Word of God, if he's sent by the Word of God and with the Word of God. Same in every age it's always been. We can't live by yesterday's light. Yesterday's light is history. We know nothing about it. You can't get warm today by the sun that shines yesterday. That's what's the matter with the churches today. That's what's the matter with the people who are trying to live by what happened yesterday. You can't warm by a painted fire. Certainly not. It has no heat in it. Yesterday's sun has no heat in it. The sunlight is sent to the earth and the natural to ripen the grain for the advancing harvest. Each day brings forth a new sun. The sun that's shining today bringing the wheat up in Canada, that same sun 
Well, if it had, it didn't have no more sun in that this coming July or August, it could never ripen the grain. It's got to be stronger and more powerful. Each day it grows and matures to bring the grain on. Now, if the grain itself, if it begins to mature, the grain comes on. If it stays right with the grain, it only builds the grain. Each day, the husk around it, the, the part calcium and whatever goes in it, builds right into the grain as the sun gets stronger. But you take the sun that shines in August and put it on the wheat today, it would kill it. Certainly you can't do that. It must come in its season. So must God's uh, wheat and grain ripen just in the season, the season it's in. But how could a sun, well, a wheat would die, the fruits would die by the sun that lives today, uh, shines today rather. It's gone coming harvest, it's ripening. The grain should mature with the light. But the thing is, today the church grain don't want to mature. It wants to stay like it was back in Moody's time, Sankey, Finney, Knox, Calvin. They were all right. They were the light of the hour. But this is another hour. This is another day. This is the advancement of the gospel. It's coming to its maturity. So we can't live in what Luther said, Wesley said, or some of the rest of it. We're living in the light that's predicted for this day. We're in the seventh church age, not the third or fourth church age. The grain should be able to receive it. If it doesn't, it falls off and it means nothing to it. The grain is matured with the light if it goes ahead with the light. So should the church bring forth the bread of each age that Jesus commanded that man shall live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The bread that we need is in the Bible. It is a complete revelation of God's plan. It's a complete revelation of Jesus Christ. We add nothing to it or take anything from it. Whosoever does, his name will be taken out of the book of life. We don't need any creeds to add to this. It's written just the way it's supposed to be. We don't add nothing to it. Take nothing from it. Preach it just the way it is. And God is will manifest it. Every promise that He promised, He'll manifest it just the same. We're not supposed to take from it or add to it. Just leave it the way it is. But you see, today, we find the people like it was somewhat in that day there, trying to live back in a glare. The church should ripen as the wheat ripens. That man shall live by not by bread alone, but by every word of God, the bread of life. Not just part of the words. Every word of God. Every age. Just don't stay and eat beans and potatoes all the time. These other things goes with it. As we go on into the full course of God's great dinner that's set before His people, the power of the Holy Ghost, the, the rejoicing of it, of the power and the Spirit that has been given. The works that I do shall you do also. Because I live, you live also. The promises that Jesus made to His church. And yet today, we find people trying to go way back into some other age that's gone by. Luther's age, it was a great age. He saw the faulty of the Catholic church, saw the communion, that, that young priest. He saw that that was wrong. It wasn't the literal body of Christ. It was a piece of bread that they had blessed. And he saw that the wine wasn't the literal blood, but it represented the blood. So he protested the thing because the hour of that time was there. And no matter how many priests they had and whatever more they had, God got a hold of a man that can make the light shine. Amen. Amen. He accepted justification by faith. And he made the light of the Lutheran age shine. After that, come along, that lived his time out. There come another time that the church should get away from its sins and be sanctified. Along come John Wesley, a little uh, Anglican man from over in England there that belonged to the Anglican church. But he saw the light on the gospel. It was an hour for that Philadelphian age to come forth. And when he did, he preached the second works of grace, a sanctification by the blood of Jesus Christ. There was nothing could stand in its life. He was considered a fanatic just like Luther was, but he protested all the rest of them was and shined forth the light because it was the light of the hour. God found a man, John Wesley, who could turn on the light. He found on, and also a uh, Luther that turned on the light for that age. Then along come the Pentecostal brethren. They come back in their age of the restoration of the gifts. Restore back the gifts of speaking in tongues, the gifts of healing, and things to the church. Now, they did just exactly what the Scriptures said they would do. And when they did, they manifested it. That's exactly right. But did you realize we moved on from that? We're in the bride time, the selecting time. The time that the bride, they said we would have. All the caterpillar left, said Joel 2.28... 
All the caterpillar left the, the palm worm eating. All the palm worm left the locust eating. Each one of those organizations, if you've read the seven seals of the Bible, each one of those reformers went forth and preached the word, but left something off. Then what did they do after the reformers over in the light began to dim out? Instead of walking on into further light, they organized it. And when they organized it, we believe this light. This is the light. This is it. What did they do? Wesley come right on and moved away from them. What did Wesley do? He organized after him and uh, his, his brother John and, and uh, Charles and, and along come uh, Asbury and those. And after their days, they organized what was called the Methodist Church. What did they do? They rejected further light. Amen. They just said, this is the light. This is it. Then along come the Pentecostals and showed them up that Amen. God still sends down the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. He still brings down His power of healing, Amen. which they denied. Amen. What did he do? Walk right away from him because it was another light. What is it now? We've passed around 60 years. The Pentecostals is organized. We are this, we are that, and God's walked right away from him. Now he's not only bringing forth a bride, a elect, out of that group, which shall never been in their church age, at Philadelphia church age, was Wesley, and the Lady of Sea church age is a Pentecostal organization, which all goes right straight into the mark of the beast. That's the Bible. This brother was saying a few moments ago. That is true, right? They're all them organization because they refuse to walk in further light. They organize themselves and say, we believe this. When God does something, check it with the Scripture. The Pharisees said, we have it. The Sadducees said, we have it. But God had it. God turned on the key and showed the light. It was rejected like it's always been. The Catholic Church rejected Luther. Wesley rejected uh, 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 Luther. Uh, and so also the Pentecostal rejected Wesley, and the Holy Spirit today is rejecting the Pentecostals. You're getting just as formal and cold as the rest of them. Everybody can see that. I love you. The closest thing there is to the Bible that I know of. That's why I'm with you. But listen, open your eyes and see the day that we're living in. It's time for the key to turn again and a light to come on to take out a tree. The Bible said in Malachi 4, he would send forth and restore again the original faith that was with the people. He promised it. He's always done it. He sent his word and the prophets came because the word came to the prophets and they had the word and made it live. The organizations and systems of the time turned it down. Every age. So will they do it today. God just is able today to rise a man now as he was then. He never did raise an organization. Ask any historian, look through the history. On an organization organized, it died there and never raised again. God speaks to individuals. Right? And God promised to do it again in the last days, and that He'll do. What God has promised, that He will do to turn on a light that can vindicate the promised scriptures of the day. Jesus said, as it was in the days of, of Lot, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. You show, you see what they're doing. Look at Jehovah, what he's done. Our father has set everything in position. There's Lot down there in the world, down there in Sodom with all the sin, lukewarm. There's a messenger down there preaching to him too. There's Abraham's group, the elected pulled out. The one with the promise waiting truly for the son. Lot was looking for his son also, but not in the form that Abraham was looking for him. What happened just before it happened? God come down and manifested himself in flesh and declared that he was the word. For the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword and a discerner of the thoughts that's in the heart. Jesus said, so shall it be again at the coming of the Son of Man. These promises are divine. They were spoke by the lips of Jesus Christ. Both heavens and earth will fail, but they never will fail. God is still able of the stones to rise children unto Abraham. Oh, yes. We are in our journey or something like Israel was. Israel in their journey had to get new manna every day for new manna fell. We are supposed not to live in the light of Luther, live in the light of, of Wesley, or live in the light of Pentecost. We're in another age. New manna. Amen. What happened if they tried to keep that manna over? It contaminated. Amen. It would kill them. That's the reason we got so many spiritual dead so-called Christians. Amen. They're eating a glare of another day. They're eating manna that's already contaminated. Amen. It's like the husk up on the wheat. If it doesn't go into the wheat, it goes off of the wheat. And when light is rejected, there isn't but one thing to do. Turn into darkness. Any portion of the night would refuse to see the light goes back into darkness. So does it in the gospel. And every age has been proven to be so. We're living in that time. Yesterday's manna is contaminated. 
I hear people say, 40 years ago I did so and so. That's right. But what about today? What about the church on fire? We talked about yesterday. What about the church today? What about you as an individual today? For yesterday's won't do for the day. It was all right yesterday. Luther's message was the light of the hour, like John's was. But there rose a greater light. So was Luther a great light. And we enjoyed him for a season. But there come another light to shut his off. What it ought to do is blend with it. And it went on to the perfect loaf of bread. Went on to a perfect man of God. But what did they do? They organized. Man's got into it. Instead of God leading it, man and the systems got into it. Blind it all. All this bride tree, today it's been pruned. Any branch that doesn't bring forth fruit is pruned. Jesus said so. St. John 15. What's happened now? We see that they've been cut off, pruned off. Remember, the very heart of the tree is right in the center of the tree. The fruit will always right in the last place a tree will ever bear fruit is right in the top of it because it's the freshest that comes from the center of the life. It's in the seed. It's a bride tree. Jesus was a bride. He was a tree. They cut him down. He was a tree of life that was in the Garden of Eden. They cut him down and hung him on a Roman tree to make fun of him. What did he do? God raised him up the third day from the dead. And today there's a bride tree. It started back there at the beginning. Way back at the day of Pentecost. Listen, you people who belong to church. The church never started in Nicaea, Rome. It started in Jerusalem. Amen. On the day of Pentecost, started the church. And then what did they do? They just kept organizing and God keeps cutting off the branches. Then they organized the Lutheran and cut off the branches. Wesley cut off the branches. Pentecost cut off the branches. Until it's come, but God's going to have a bride tree. All that the canker worm eat and the caterpillar eat, I will restore, saith the Lord. Malachi 4 tells us we'll be brought back to the original faith like it was on the day of Pentecost, the faith of the fathers. We believe that it will come. I believe it's time for it now. The limbs are withered and dried up and they'll be uh, taken out from the tree so that the fruit can bear itself right in the top of the tree. Oh my, all these lights are all right. The church today is that light plus what it has received today. Uh, It's to finish the harvest as we find out that the tree itself or the wheat must mature with the light. Raising itself up from a blade to a grain and from a grain on, it matures with the light. Light of other ages only bear record of this age. The light of Luther bore record of of the light of Wesley. Wesley bore light of Pentecost. It's the same light, only matured on by the light. If the people could only see it. Some time ago I was reading a little article for the Queen of England, not this queen, the other queen. She went to see a paper company that had been making such fine paper. And when she was interviewed by the president of the company, he taken her through. She wanted to see how that fine paper was made. He taken her and showed her all the great presses and things. And in those days, they made paper out of rags. We well remember that. So he went into a room and opened a door and there was nothing but a bunch of rags. The queen in astonishment said, what's these dirty things? The man, that, uh, the president of the company said, that was clothing yesterday. See, it has become dirty. We do not throw it away, but it's a paper of tomorrow. She said, I don't understand this. He said, you'll understand it tomorrow. So when they run these rags through the press to a certain possession of cleansing and, and a certain thing it had to go through, a process, when it come out, it was beautiful sheets of paper. The president thought he would show the queen something that she never knew. He put her profile on it and pressed it into this beautiful paper. When the queen received it, she seen her own profile and what was dirty rags yesterday because it went through a certain process. Oh, if Luther, Wesley, and all of them could see that. That yesterday's stuff can only be used as it goes through a process. When the Holy Ghost reveals the light from justification to sanctification to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And now the last hour of the coming of Christ. It's got in it the profile, not of the queen, but of the king of heaven that represents himself as the church has become poster into the minority. But the ministry has to be the same kind of a ministry that he had. Those who died in Luther's age down at the bottom of the pyramid, like not a pyramid teaching, but just for an example. That pyramid is so perfect as any of us has been there. You can't run a razor blade hardly. The, they had no mortar in it as far as we know. The architecture of it was so great. Now they lost the headstone. They don't know where it's at. Now when that headstone returns, 
It'll be just like the rest of it. It will blend in with the stone that's left open. If you should put the headstone on it, it has to be that way. And when Jesus returns, you'll find a church that's washed without spot or wrinkle. And it'll be the same ministry he had. It'll bring back the headstone. Like my hand here in a shadow. It's a shadow on this darker. As my hand becomes more, it's a negative here, a positive here. As the negative and positive, it gets denser, darker, darker, darker. And finally it claps together. And negative and positive becomes one. That's when church and Christ unites together as a bride. With the same spirit that was in him will be upon her. When that church comes from justification, sanctification, baptism of the Holy Ghost into the last days and honing her down now for the coming of the Lord. Oh, don't be the rough part on it. Pentecostal brother, shine up with the word and believe every bit of it. Don't get out into these isms and things as we see going on today. Don't be astonished at that because the headstone's coming crying uh, and by father pretty soon. My God, my God. Yes, I believe that with all my heart. Do you see it? You know what I mean? It's Christ now taking the rags of yesterday, the Lutheran, Methodist, Presbyterian, and so forth, and he's putting it through a process. What kind of a process? A process of the Holy Spirit. What they had plus. Making it to his, pressing his own image. When the church in Christ becomes one in union. God grant it. I trust that you see it. If you do see it, it reminds me of a story. That when the, the great Welsh revival is on, some great man here in the nation thought they'd go over and see the Welsh revival, what would be taking place. And as they went over to find out, they'd see what building it was held in. When they got to Wales, they went around and began to ask about where the building was. They seen a happy little officer standing on the corner with his uh, little uh, Tommy hat on, his, oh, swinging his club around and around like that. And so these men walked up to him and said, Sir, could you tell me what building... The Welch revival is held in. He said, yes, sir, I'm it. <laughs> I'm it. Why? He was shedding forth the joy and the light of the Welch revival. So ought the church of Pentecost today. Preston, who is Jesus Christ? The same yesterday, today, and forever. His light of his gospel ought to be shining forth with the word of this age. Revealing Jesus Christ to the nation just like it was. He was so filled with the Welch revival that he was a Welch revival. We ought to be so filled with Christ till we, we reflect him in the power of his word is allotted to us to this day. Brethren, don't be stooped in things of the world. Don't these cares take you away. Stay with the gospel. Watch every word. Don't go back to what some father said. Let's go right now what Jesus said was to take place in this day. Yes, sir, we are supposed to be the light of this age, manifesting the gospel. Luther was his light. Wesley was his light. Pentecost was his light. But we're farther up the road now. We're coming into the bride, called out the elected. Remember, if you are, you're just like that officer. He had it in him. Remember, this is the seventh church age. The Lady of Sin church age, according to Revelation 3, they reject Christ. Of every church age that was mentioned in the Bible. The Lady of Sia age is worst of all of them. It turned him out. Rejected him. Put him on the outside. Did you see the moon black out the other night? Before the Pope went over to Rome? From Rome to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the oldest church. The moon is a type of the church. Always reflecting the light of the sun in the absence of the sun. And it blacked out. I draw that on a blackboard here three or four years ago and show the churches in hundreds and thousands of homes across the nation. What was it? A shadow the first time a pope ever left to come back here. Come into the name of Paul and so forth. Went out through those places. Had to bless the river to cross it and so forth. What does the, the river need blessing? What's the matter with this church age that we're living in today? Can't you see it? God declaring it in the sky, declaring it in His Word, declaring it on the paper, declaring it amongst the people. Can't you open your eyes and see the hour? These are they that testify the truth. This is a light of the hour. Watch the great ecumenical moves going into this council up there now. Just forming an image of the beast in Revelation 17. Exactly what it said it would do. You Pentecostal people are going to sit still for that and go into it. The forcing hours come. Now is the time to rise and trim your lane and shine with the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of God. I know this is improper when many of my Pentecostal friends sit with the Pope and things and say a very spiritual feeling. To me, it's, a, it's wrong. It's against the Bible. Let the Word of God be the truth. Yes, sir. It's time now. We see these great moves going on in the world. It looks good to the natural eye. Sure. 
Caiaphas looked good to what he was revealing to the priest of that day. All that day, but Jesus was a light that was making the word live. But their counsels and so forth had blinded their eyes to it. He said, let them alone. The blind lead the blind. They'll all fall in the ditch. We are back to that time again, brothers and sisters. We're back to that hour again. Notice why. Same cause. We find that the, these great lights that we've lived in in the days gone by, they were all right. We have nothing against them. But this lady of see a church age, be careful. Remember, it is a Christ rejected. And that's exactly what it is now. This great council has moved around and unite all the Protestants together. This ecumenical move. And what is it doing? It's blackening out the very word itself. And the word is Christ. How can they do when the Christian Science United Brethren and many of them people and other great organizations, some believe the virgin birth, some don't, some believe this and that. How can you join yourself with unbelief? How can you walk together unless they agree? Come out from among to be separated and take God's holy word and stay by it. Jesus Christ is obligated to manifest his word. The thing we need today is a rising of Malachi 4. Yes. Another prophet will rise in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And will produce exactly what he promised to do. Then man blindly will forsake it and walk right into the darkness as he always did. Watch now. We find out the same cause. That the day that they reject the churches, uh, reject the message, crucify the word, take the word out. Now if you don't belong to it, you can't even, you can't even have your church. You'll close it down. You've got to come into it. If you don't do it, you're closed down. Then what about it? Oh, stand for that which is right. Remember, it's crucifixion time again, nearly. False light calls the greatest, the greatest robbery the world ever had in England not long ago. The greatest robbery that was ever performed was done by a false light. Seven million dollar robbery. It was done by a false light that slowed that train down. And Scotland Yard couldn't find the man. They got away with it so slicky. That was known as the greatest robbery that was ever done by robbers in the natural. Amen. It robbed the world of its greatest robbery. And the greatest robbery that was ever done to the church of Jesus Christ is done by false light, a glare of some other age and rejecting the light that's predicted for this age. Amen. Amen. False light, a glare of yesterday. Don't walk in the glare of yesterday. Walk in the warmth of the sun today. Don't pull yourself down into denominational shade saying the days of miracles is past. Jesus said, These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall pass. The devils, they shall speak with new tongues. These signs shall follow them. They said, It's all right for the apostles, not for us. That's a glare. Jesus said, These signs shall follow them that believe to all the world. Yes, sir. Now, what's the matter? Walking in a glare. It's caused the greatest robbery. It's taken the Christ from the church. See, how can Christ manifest Himself in a word that's promised today by some cold creed of yesterday? Yeah. It does warm the seed. No, sir. The church's greatest robbery. Warm. But remember, that cold creed light will not ripen the seed of today. It denies the seed. Yeah. It's the fog gets up on the earth. The dense is. It's time for God to rise and turn on the light again. Yeah. Make his word to live. Certainly, light, a cold creed, won't ripen the grain. It certainly won't. And remember, civilization has traveled with the sun. And I told you in the beginning, I have to watch parables the way nature runs. I have the education to do it. I don't want it. I'd rather have all of God than all the education in the world. I have Jesus Christ. I see him live his word right through. That's all I need to know. And if a man is born to the Spirit of God, he'll search the Scripture and see if it's the answer for today. The answer today is Christ. Christ is the Word. When the Word comes to life, it shows the light that's promised of the day. In this dark, late of and age, just a few, as many as I receive, I chasten, I rebuke, repent, Jesus said, and return back. Turn to the Word. He is the Word. Come to Him. Yes, sir. Watch the light. It will come from the east going west. We're at the west coast. He had three stages, didn't it? They had three stages across the water three times from Paul across the Mediterranean come into Germany. Germany lit up with Luther across the English Channel over into the United States and now over into the England. Then England had come across the Pacific to the United States and she's worked her way down to Luther's message on down to until the last part of it is here on the West Coast again. And from the ripening of the grain from all the way back from Luther all the way down to the age, it ought to be the fullness of the gospel now. 
the power of God to ripen the light that's been shown through justification, sanctification in the Pentecostal age, or to ripen the bright tree for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That Christ could be manifested in his church as one person, him and his wife, him and his bride. Amen. This is the hour we're living. This is the light of the day. Walk in and be saved all the ends of the world. Church glare of this day was very deceiving, Jesus said in Matthew 24. He said it would deceive the very elected if possible. See, not Luther wouldn't receive, Luther couldn't deceive a Methodist. A Methodist couldn't deceive a Pentecostal. Amen. That's right, see. But what about the bride? Amen. That's what puts the Pentecostal's eyes out. Amen. Yeah. See, you went back to your creed, to your farm, organized, done a bunch of men telling you what to do. The Bible promises these things. Amen. We need men and women that's filled with the Spirit of God. Amen. If you say you got the Spirit of God in you and God makes a certain promise in here, how? can that Holy Ghost to punctuate and say, well, it might be all right for another age. We don't believe it that way. That ain't the Holy Spirit. The man that's filled with God, him and the Word is one. Amen. Certainly it is. It's a product of a union, a union between God and man. How can a woman that's going to be a husband of a man contrary doing the things that he don't want her to do? How can we flirt with the world and denominations and organizations and turn down the light of the hour? How can it be done, brother and sister, with godly love and respect for each one of you? How can we accept these things? How can we hear it? It throws right back in our lap again. Don't condemn Lutherans because they condemn Catholic. Don't condemn Wesley because he condemned Lutheran. See, like that, when you condemn the thing that's happening today and turn from it, when you see your church is going to this great ecumenical move and so forth, that leading you everyone into the mark of the beast. And you've got it. Many honest hearted people walk right straight into it. They say they're good people, holy people. So are those priests. If I had to take the holiness of Jesus Christ or the fruits of the Spirit, many of you have went on this. Now, no disregard to it. I believe every word of it. Many of you say, oh, I spoke in tongues. I got it. That ain't it. Amen. No, sir. Many of them say the fruit of the Spirit. That's it. Is it? Let's put Jesus on trial. God, forgive me for a moment. Let's bring you up and I'll be the priest. I say to you, this young fellow coming to the city called Jesus of Nazareth. Don't you listen to him. We believe the fruit of the Spirit. I look here, your kind old priest. He, his grandfather, great-grandfather, all were priests. He sacrificed all of his young life. He stayed right in the seminary. He watched. He believed. He, he done everything they were taught him. He knows the Scripture from A to Z. He even writes it himself. Writes the Scriptures himself. The scribes do. Here he is, a grand man. You know he is. What happened when your mother was giving birth to you? Who stood by your bedside? That kind old priest. When mother and dad was going to separate, who put their arms around both and led them back to God? That kind old priest. Yeah. And here, Jehovah requires a lamb for sacrifice for sin. The businessman. They live in cities here and they, they sell their goods and, and so forth and their products and produce and whatever they're going to sell. They don't raise lambs. And what did the priest do? Made a little stand up there for him to sell lambs so this man could go in and clear his soul with Jehovah. What did this fellow Jesus of Nazareth do? What church did he come from? What denomination does he belong to? What fellowship card? We'll kick him out. We won't up to him because he condemns every one of us. What did he do? He goes up there and takes that where men are trying to get their soul saved. The church, as we would call it today, you spiritual minded people. He kicked over the table, threw out the change, took a ropes and tied them together and run out and called that godly old priest of yours the son of the devil. That kind old man that loans you that money when he was in trouble. Who's going to stand by you and bury you when you're dead? That kind old priest. He's got the fruit of the Spirit. But does this Jesus of Nazareth have the fruit of the Spirit? You can't judge by speaking in tongues. Neither can you judge by the fruit of the Spirit. But it's a manifestation of the Word of God. Brought to lie. It's a light that does it. The man that walks in that light. Jesus Christ was not... Failing upon speaking in tongues, though he did. He was not the fruit of the Spirit, though he did. You couldn't judge it. But he believed and punctuated that God lived every word of the promise of that day through him. That's the light of the hour. That's the evidence when a man tells me that the Holy Ghost falling in them will deny the word of God being so. There's something wrong with it. There's something wrong with our seminaries and so forth. When they teach man all this your brainwashed theology and stuff of the day, that man would have done the same against the word of God and lead him right into that ecumenical slaughter down there. Well, certainly it's wrong. I speak that in the name of the Lord. You watch and see if it isn't true. 
the light, the light of the hour. Those cold creeds can never bring a harvest. We've got to have a church that's washed in the blood of the Lamb and become one with the Word. Be the church. Church glares at this day, Jesus said, very deceiving, almost the elected, if it were possible. Just the elected. But as it was in the days of Noah, when eight souls were saved, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Very, very few will be saved at that time. What does it do? It leads right on to the slaughter. We find that in this present darkness that we're living. I'm closing by saying this. In this present darkness that we're living, these days that we're now living in, when light is done, turned out in the heavens, it's turned out here amongst before to show us, showed by the Bible and the seven seals what was taking place. And here God declares it right in the heaven, comes right down and declares it on earth, and the church is walking right into it. Who will save that little word-keeping bride then? What's going to happen to her when she's turned out into the cold by herself? She won't be cold. The vindicated word of the promise this day. Oh, yes. It's like a, it's puzzling. I know it is to people to see the church just say what's well, just almost the same thing. Jesus said it would be that way. It, be, it would deceive the very elected if it was possible. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. This reminds me of a fellow in Florida not long ago. He was talking and said he had a Chevrolet car that went out on him in Florida. And said he took it to the garage. And this mechanic was going along there. And he got everything set together. And he couldn't get it to start. He put everything in it that he could. He renewed all these different things. But something other, it just wouldn't work. And he couldn't get it started. He just kept trying and trying. The little mechanic was nervous, running around over the building, picking up this. And the man standing said, I'm waiting on my car, sir. I'm late. Can't you get it? He said, I'm doing all I can do. Real nervous and carrying on. And he walked along directly. A well-dressed gentleman walked up and looked at him a few moments. And he said to the mechanic, after you let him butt his head around a little while, he said, why don't you just touch this? You're not getting any current. So he said, I never thought of that. So he just turned that other little thing, what it was there, and he got the, the current in. The car started. He turned around and said, who are you? You know who he was? The chief engineer of the, of the General Motor. He made the thing. He designed it. And this hour, brother, when we wonder what's the matter with our revival, what's the matter? We got the material and everything. We got the mechanics, but where's the dynamics? That's what we need to move Jesus Christ in on the scene. What's the matter? I tell you, there's one here today. Hallelujah. Call the Holy Ghost that can touch the dynamics. He is the dynamics of the mechanics. We stand today as Pentecostals, one of the greatest churches in the nation. Thousands times thousands added each year. But where is that Holy Ghost? We've accepted by speaking in tongues, and we've seen how it's acted. Methodists accepted by shouting, Luther accepted by faith, and so forth like that. That isn't it. It's the Word. It's the Word turned on the light, turns on the mechanics, and they become dynamics. There are dynamics when the, uh, dynamics when the dynamic comes to the mechanic. It starts the thing rolling. That's right. Take the Word. If there's one of those things messed up on it, it won't start. Lay aside every weight, every ism, every creed. That the dynamics of the Holy Spirit might flow through the Word and vindicate the Word that's promised to this day. Then the great church of God will rise to her feet like a jet propelled plane, take off to the skies to meet her master. That's exactly right. Until we do that, it won't work. That's what it's about. Yes, sir. Who will do it? Who will keep it in this day that we're thinking about? Remember, remember, brother. Uh, it reminds me of another little story, not uh, going back to stories. But a friend of mine was standing at Carlsbad, New Mexico, when we was there holding a meeting of uh, Carlsbad. And uh, there's a bunch of people went down into this cave. Oh, I, I never did like that stuff. Down there where it's deep, about a mile on the ground. Uh, I'm satisfied up here. So they went down to, I want to go higher, not lower. So uh, they took this fellow, went down in there, and there's a man friend, and his little girl and little boy went down with him. And they went way down into a big basement, oh, I guess hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of feet below the surface of the earth, went down there. And the man there by the switch all at once turned off the switch. And it was so black and dark till you couldn't even see your hand moving down in front of your face. A little girl, a little thing was real scared. She began to scream to the top of her voice. Oh, it's dark, it's dark, it's dark. Hysterically screaming. Her little brother had to be standing. He screamed out in the darkness. He said, fear not, little sister. There's a man here who can turn on the light. Amen. Hallelujah. What's the little church going to do? Don't worry. There's a man here today that can turn on the light. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah. The Lord Jesus Christ. 
Remember, the blind, the, the rich man in the days of the birth of Jesus, they wasn't put out and blinded from the glare of Jerusalem when they got there asking about him. Their theology, theology couldn't explain it. But when they turned aside, they followed to the eternal life like you businessmen today. Don't watch the glares of these organizations, but hold on to the word. It leads you to the light. Fear not, little sister. There's a man here who can turn on the lights. There's a Christ here who can make his word live just the same as he was. And vindicate himself that he's the same yesterday and the ever. Do you believe it? Amen. Let us stand. We've got 15 minutes before the time to go to the next meeting. Would you like to raise your hands and say, God, turn the light on me I believe the word. I believe the mechanics. Put the dynamics in me, Lord. Raise your hands and cry out to him, Lord. Turn the lights on. There is a man here that can turn the lights. We're dead in communism and eat up with all kinds of kingdom and worms of organizations. But there is a man here who can turn on the lights. That man is the Holy Ghost himself. Jesus Christ manifested in the Spirit. Lord Jesus, touch each one of these hands. Not only hands, but run down the arm to the heart and turn the light of the gospel in Jesus.